Today, I wanna to share three tips with you today. Number one, how to grow your bees in the spring, make sure they're just prospering. And number two, how to make as much honey as you can from your bees. And number three, how to keep your mite levels down without dousing your bees with every known toxic chemical known to man. Hey everybody, David Burns, good to be with you today. Happy Tuesday, so glad to be with you. Hope everything is going well for you. Yeah, these three tips today are gonna to be very important for us to understand how to monitor and help our bees really get off to a good start, whether you are a brand new beekeeper starting out with a package or a nucleus, or if you're an experienced multiple year beekeeper coming out of winter with your bees, you still want them to have these three tips you want these things to really be happening. The first one is, how do you grow your bees? Now, when you open up a hive and you start looking at your bees and expanding, you wanna see them really growing well, right? And you start measuring that by how many frames of brood you have, and basically how many bees are in the box. All of us love to open up a box of bees and all at once see bees covering the top bar frames and just lifting up frame after frame of brood. And if we don't see that, it could mean that our bees are struggling. Certainly, they are behind in the spring. So they're gonna get off to a much better start. They're gonna grow much faster if we can help them out. What do you do to help them as a beekeeper? Well, the first thing you need to do is feed your bees in the spring. And that's especially before you have an abundance of you know, natural things blooming in your area. If you just don't see a lot of floral resources in your area, it's still kind of cold, or the bees just can't get to it because of cold spring, rainy weather, feeding them is always gonna help. So just because you drive down the road and you see a bunch of flowering trees and everything, and you think, okay, good, I see dandelions, these flowering trees, so my bees ought to be getting that nectar and growing, get this, are they able to fly? Like here recently in Illinois, we've had almost every day has been just barely warm enough for some of the bees to fly, but not really. And yet everything is starting to bloom, like the trees especially, not so much dandelions, but the trees. I want my bees to go out there and fly and forage on the blooming early fruit trees and such, but rainy weather, windy weather, it's been extremely windy, bees haven't been flying, been colder at night, so it doesn't really warm up you know, much until the afternoon above 50, and by then it's only an hour or two where the bees can fly. That's the important point I'm wanting to make. That's when you wanna be feeding your bees because they don't just get hungry at two o'clock in the afternoon when it finally warms up warm enough for them to go out. They're hungry 24 seven. So by feeding them one-to-one -one sugar water, it's gonna help them expand and grow so much faster. Now let's talk about one to one, why don't you use one to one or two to one? Two to one is much more syrupy, so it's really not necessary. We're kind of wanting to mimic what's out there in nature, and nature is pretty thin on the, the nectar is pretty thin in flowers. And so one to one is pretty close uh, to what the bees would get in nature. Now, I know some people, historically for a long period of time, um, way back, people have uh, usually said that thinner, Syrup works great also. And that means even thinner than one-to-one. -one. So in other words, uh, one part water, one part sugar, or you could use two parts water and one part sugar, and it would still work well. Now, some people even go way beyond that, and they just make you know a little bit. I've heard things like one to eight, uh, one part um, sugar to eight parts of water, for example. Um, so. If you go too thin, here's my concern. I'm wanting, a, I'm wanting several things to happen with my sugar water that I'm feeding my bees in the spring. Number one, I want them to be able to eat it as a resource to get carbohydrates to be energized to stimulate the entire colony to uh, feel like it's spring and start raising brood and feed brood. But number two, get this, I want them to build comb out, especially those of you with new um, equipment where you have undrawn frames, you want the, the sugar water to promote the drawing out of the wax on the frames. Now, here's something you need to know. This wax that bees produce, they produce in their bodies. They have eight wax glands on the underside of their abdomen. These glands are activated in bees between 12 and 17 days old. 
and they are the only bees that can make wax. Now, I, I realize older foragers can come back and make wax, but not very good at it. So mainly we leave it up to the younger people, the younger bees that have the wax glands activated. If they aren't getting a good source of sugar water, nectar, honey, then they really can't make wax. Here's the other thing though. It needs to be about 55 degrees outside and at least 95 degrees inside the hive for your bees to be able to make an abundant amount of wax build out your frames. This is why a lot of beekeepers who get their bees really early and then it cools off and it stays, you know, 50 or below for a while and they just installed a new package of bees and they can't understand why the bees aren't drawing out more comb. It's because the outside temperature and the inside temperature is not warm enough for them to really go to town and start activating those wax glands and making wax to then transfer it onto the comb. So we need several things to happen with that sugar water. We need it to be um, enough sugar in there to activate those wax glands and we need it to be warm enough for the bees to make the wax. So if you're just starting out as a new beekeeper, remember that. But if you've, you're an experienced beekeeper, here's another thing that you can consider. Use some of the frames that you had last year. Maybe you lost a hive or two that wasn't caused from a disease. You can put some of that older comb that's uh, maybe a year old into place uh, in, instead of a undrawn comb. And that'll give your bees a much more head start, help them grow a lot faster. Other things that you can do to really help your bees grow and make you proud that you're a beekeeper because your bees are just blowing up and expanding so much, gotta monitor the queen. This is where a lot of beekeepers really aren't sure how to do that. You need to be able to look at your frames of brood and determine if your queen is laying really well. And so she needs to be laying 1,500 to 2,500 eggs a day that's gonna build the population up really fast. And here's the thing, if she's not pulling her own weight, it could be her, it could be that she has a problem, not a good queen, or it could be from a lack of food or a lack of space in the hive. So you kinda of have to weigh all that out, but certainly you've gotta make sure these situations like the queen laying enough eggs, enough space in the hive for her to lay eggs, and enough food resources in the hive for the nurse bees to be fed well to make royal jelly to raise that brood. A lot needs to happen, including wax building. Now let's say that you master all of that and it's wonderful. You got plenty of wax building, you got plenty of uh, uh, eggs that the queen is laying, you got plenty of good food coming on there. Here's the next thing you need to do to grow your bees early in the spring and that is give them enough room to expand. Make sure they don't get crowded too quickly. This can really make the bees sort of like turn against the queen. For example, if the queen is laying and there's maybe two or three frames that they have drawn out and the queen starts laying and fills all that up and now she has no place else to lay, guess what? The bees can actually blame no more eggs being laid on the queen and they will supersede her. They think she's the problem even though she just doesn't have any space to lay. So you always need to provide space for the queen to lay, for the foragers to bring in more resources. So do be thinking about providing enough room for the growth of your bees early in the spring. Now, this is one of my most favorite tips that I tell everybody how to grow their hives, especially those of you that are in a single deep and you're wanting to get into a, a double deep, like a new package or nucleus, or even if you overwintered a single deep and now you would changed your mind, you wanna have a double deep. Here's what I like to do. When that double deep, or that bottom deep has about six or seven frames that are drawn out with bees on it, and you're ready to add your other deep box on top of it for a brood box, before you do, pull out a frame out of that deep box that has open larvae on it, and the queen, if that's there, doesn't have, the queen doesn't have to be there, but open larvae is key. Take that out, put your second deep on top, maybe it's all undrawn foundation, and then put your frame of open brood in that top deep with bees on it and all, just slip it out. Now on the bottom, when you removed one, you've got to put another frame in that spot. Don't leave that empty. You've got to put another frame, either undrawn or drawn in there and let them work it. And then put the second deep on with that new frame of open brood in that top deep. 
Because what we're trying to do is bait or lure the bees up out of the bottom, especially the nurse bees, to go up into that second deep. They'll start working the open brood, feeding the larvae, and then they'll start expanding out. Uh, in addition to the bottom, they'll start expanding the top as well. It's just a really cool trick that I've used, and it works so well to speed your growth up in the spring. Now, before we jump into the second tip today on how to make more honey in the spring, I want to encourage you guys to jump into my live stream coming up this Thursday with Dr. David Peck. A lot of you have been asking me questions on mite treatment, and there are some new mite treatments in 2024 that we really need to look at and see if this is the way to go. So there's some changes this year in beekeeping mite control treatment. Dr. Peck is going to be here Thursday night on my live stream to answer all of your questions. You can ask him questions about treatments, but there's some new stuff going on like blue, green, algae, and different types of treatments that may really be effective in 2024. Follow this link right here. Join me for my live stream this Thursday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. Now, tip number two is all about how do you get your bees in the spring to make more honey? If you are just starting out this year with a package or a nucleus, I got to tell you right up front, there's a pretty good chance that your bees are going to be spending so much time turning the nectar and honey into wax through their wax glands and making comb, building out comb, that they may not be able to store a lot of surplus honey for you. So first year beekeepers, if you're putting them on undrawn foundation, just be happy if you get all your foundation drawn out, either in your two deeps or in your supers, don't be disappointed if they really don't make you any honey that first year. Just go into it not expecting much. It can happen and it does happen, but oftentimes it doesn't. Again, they're just using all of that incoming nectar. Instead of making it into stored honey, they're making it into wax to build out their brood nest area and extend the wax out in the supers. Now, if you're coming out of winter as a second or multiple year beekeeper, be excited because this is your opportunity to really maximize on this honey production. Two great tips for you if you're in your multiple year beekeeping and you want to make a lot of honey this spring, here's how you do it. You got to make sure that you don't have to use any undrawn foundation. In other words, maybe you have some stored foundation that's completely drawn out from other hives that maybe either perish or that uh, you just have extra drawn out frames from, you want to put those in your hives that are going to make you honey. And that's particularly true of honey supers, okay? So honey supers that are drawn out are always going to make you more honey than those that the bees have to spend time drawing out. So try to capitalize on all your honey supers that already have been drawn out. Now, the second thing about that is you need a whole bunch of bees. You need to have a crazy amount of foragers. Listen, it takes a lot of foragers just to bring in a little bit of honey, a little bit of nectar that they turn into honey. So I want you to be aware that you need a lot of bees. You're not going to make much honey with a small hive. So it's going to be your job to do the earlier principles of monitoring your queen, making sure she's laying a lot of eggs, and making sure there's a lot of brood in the hive. And if there's not, you're gonna have to make a decision quickly to replace that queen, get a better laying queen that can lay more eggs, and then also monitor those frames and make sure they have plenty of frames to continue to put the honey into above those two deeps. Another sneaky trick I don't want to tell this to any, everybody, but some of you listen up closely. Here's another sneaky trick that I've done before. I may take two deeps and I may take one deep off and make a split and kind of shake some bees from my split down into my uh, bottom deep, put the queen down there, overcrowd it. Yeah, overcrowd it. And then I'll put a queen excluder on. And then here's a big secret. Honey super, honey super, honey super, just add the honey supers. So we've got a whole bunch of bees in the bottom. They're wanting to go out and forage and build comb and all. And you got uh, some supers up above that triggers them to know they've got space to put some nectar to make honey. So in this case, we're utilizing a single deep. So we're cutting down on the, all the resources they have to put into two deep brood boxes and forcing them into one deep. Now that's more of an experienced beekeeper because what can happen they can swarm because they're so packed in there. But an experienced beekeeper, multiple year beekeeper, is going to be able to keep watching for swarm cells 
and take the necessary action. I'm about to tell you tip number three, how to keep your mite levels down, but let me encourage you as Bobblehead David is here to tell you to please subscribe to my channel. Subscribing to my channel helps so much and I really appreciate you guys subscribing. Just click on the link here on the subscribe button below the video here. Give me a thumbs up and it always helps too on the YouTube algorithm if you can leave a comment. So leave a comment if you have some tips on what has helped you make a lot of honey from your bees in the spring. Now let's get into tip number three. What about mite control? How do we control mites without dumping all of these harsh chemicals in our hive trying to kill a bug on a bug? Pretty tough to do. I have used a four part process of mite control that has really worked as well as chemical treatments for me. Now I'm not trying to say that I know it all or that my way is the only way or that you have to do it my way. Remember, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar where the food is. So I'm just trying to tell you this has kind of worked really well for me uh, in, in my setup. It may not for you. And I'm not saying this my way is the only way or that I'm a know-it-all. That's not true at all. So let me just tell you what has worked well for me instead of using chemicals. Number one, I can use a green drone comb. Now, green drone combs are especially um, effective because they trapped the varroa destructor mite because we know from a lot of recent studies and previous studies of years ago that mites prefer being around the drones, the drone development area. So green drone combs are made only for uh, the bees to raise their drones on. So once the mites jump into uh, the larvae just before they are capped over as pupae drones, the, the mites jump in there to reproduce. And so you take it out after it's capped over, freeze it for a couple of days, put it back in the hive, all the mites are dead. It's amazing, it works so well. No chemicals, this is just a very easy way to control your mites. It's one of several ways. The second way that I encourage you to consider controlling mites without the use of chemicals is powdered sugar dustings. Now, this has been um, tried for many years. It has been shown to be a little bit effective. It's not terribly effective, so it can't be your only thing that you can do, but it could be one thing that you can do in addition to other things to avoid these chemical treatments. And so uh, uh, this powdered sugar dusting is putting one cup of powdered sugar, sprinkle it between the frames on your brood areas and kind of dust the bees. The bees start cleaning each other off and the mites lose their grip on the bees and they fall out through hopefully a screen bottom board. That can be another thing that can help too. The third thing that we can do to do, of course, is to have a push-in queen cage. I've made many videos about this, but in case you've forgotten or haven't seen those, take a look right here. You just simply find your queen, and then you, and I usually do this in the months of August, September, and October, or July, August, and September, and I'll push this into the comb, and I'll confine the queen underneath this push-in queen cage for about a week. Now doing this will keep her from laying eggs because all mites reproduce in the cat brood of the bees. So with less brood being reared at that time of the year when mites take off and really explode, I can actually help control the mite buildup. And so this is called a, a break in the brood cycle and it really helps control mites. Now I said four things, I skipped over pretty quick, but it's the screen bottom board. Screen bottom boards are kind of debatable today. They were really a big hit many years ago, and now people aren't so crazy about them anymore. But one thing that they do well is they do allow the varroa destructor mite to fall out of the hive. And that's particularly helpful um, if you're using powdered sugar, that screen bottom board, if the, if the mites lose their grip, they fall out of the hive and it's very hard for them to get back in. They're a parasite and they're not good at climbing back into the hive, especially if the bottom board empties out through the screen, right onto the ground, and those mites just become, become part of a food chain. For those of you that were fortunate enough to come out of winter with a hive that's strong and healthy and expanding rapidly, you may have found your queen up pretty high, either in your top deep or a super above your deep, and you're wondering, oh, I need to move her down, get her laying more in all that open comb in the bottom deep. How do you move your queen down? I just made a video about it. I'll see you guys over there.